Welcome to my talk on Condition Invariant Top-Down Visual Place Recognition. This was a talk that I gave at the 2014 International Conference on Robotics and Automation. This research was done in collaboration with two other universities. First of all, Walter Shearer, Eleanor Vig, and David Cox from Harvard University, and also Oliver Bauman and Jason Mattingly from the University of Queensland. During this talk, I'll talk about the overall goal of this place recognition research uh, and give some background on where we're coming from. I'll talk about the inspiration we're drawing from human and primate vision and visual recognition and describe the approach and how we've conveyed these concepts into the place recognition domain. I'll present the experimental setup and the results we obtained from our experiments and then show you some preliminary results from human trials where we let humans compete against the algorithm. And finally, I'll present some of the future work. To motivate where we're heading in this talk, these are some of the results that the algorithm is currently able to achieve. The top two rows of this image show images of the same place under very different conditions, and our algorithm is currently able to successfully match these images of the same place. The bottom two rows show images of different places under the same conditions which just happen to look the same and our algorithm is able to not match these images despite them looking very similar. The goal of where we're heading with this work is to solve single image place recognition in the general sense and by in the general sense I mean without the benefit of prior training, without using temporal information such as sequences of images, without using semantics and without using multi-sensor information. Now obviously we would like to, for any application, make use of these other information sources, but here we're just trying to solve the pure place recognition problem as well as we can. In the current scope of this work, we're not really dealing with much camera viewpoint invariance, and that's really the subject of future work. So as we see it, there's really three approaches or general classes of approach to dealing with place recognition under changing conditions or over long periods of time. The first involve learning methods where you use carefully curated training data to learn how the appearance of an environment changes over time. The second involves using temporal or sequence based information such as my other algorithm sequence slam. And the third involves trying to come up with invariant place specific features or representations and that's what we're trying to do in this work. Now to relate the work to what has come before it, typically in the past place recognition and I guess visual navigation and slam systems in general have taken the approach of extracting some sort of classical visual features from the image and then performing place recognition. More recently when this problem of place recognition over long periods of time and under changing conditions has become more a focus of research, we've tried to adapt these feature-based methods and found that it's quite difficult first and foremost because the features don't work very well under changing conditions. What we're proposing in this work is that we take the inverse approach. So first we try and deal with condition invariance, so deal with the problems of changing appearance of an environment, and then let's try and make these condition invariant systems become more pose or camera viewpoint invariant, so dealing with the problems in the opposite order. Our inspiration comes from recent experimental studies in primate vision which have shown that the visual processing pathway becomes both increasingly selective and increasingly tolerant as information moves along it. So to grossly simplify things, early on in the visual processing pathway you might recognize a very general thing such as a, a four-legged animal but be unable to have any tolerance to recognizing it under transformations or changing lighting conditions and so forth. Further downstream you might be able to recognize a much more specific class of things such as a specific species of four-legged dog but also be able to recognize it with much greater tolerance so with scale transformations, rotation transformations and lighting transformations. So we transform this concept of variable selectivity and variable tolerance into a place recognition system which has three stages. The first stage is whole image matching, the second stage high tolerance sub image matching, and the third stage is a coherency validation step. And I'll describe each of these stages in more detail in the following slides. The first stage of the process is whole image matching. So this is where the images of the place we're trying to match are compared using low resolution 
contrast normalized images and using a comparison method such as sum of absolute differences. And this has been a comprehensively proven method uh, which has been shown in many, many papers in the past. It's very simple and what it does is it gives you a ranked list of place match hypotheses from the best match hypothesis all the way to the worst match hypothesis out of your entire da database of images. What we then do is take the top candidate image pairs from the stage one, the whole image matching, and evaluate them using stage two, which is a high tolerance sub-image matching stage. What this stage does is compare corresponding patches from the two images and try to match these patches together. And it does this in a very tolerant way. So it will match patches that look quite different to each other. Finally, in the third stage, we perform a coherency validation. So we examine the spatial shifts or relative spatial shifts of all the matched patch pairs between the two images. And we plot these spatial shifts on a two-dimensional histogram. If the spatial shifts from all the matched patches are consistent, which is revealed by having a very sharply peaked 2D histogram, then we know that the images are likely a match. So we ran two sets of experiments using the Sequence Slam day-night orderly data set, which is one of the most challenging place recognition data sets you can get right now. It consists of two eight kilometer car journeys, one during the middle of the day, one during the middle of a thunderstorm at night. Using the algorithm, we did two sets of analysis. First of all, we evaluated place recognition performance on the entire data set using the top five place match candidates output by stage one of our processing system. In the second experiment, due to compute limitations, we evaluated the first thousand frames of the second car traverse and tried to match them back to frames from the first traverse. And in this experiment, we evaluated anywhere from one to 1,000 of the top ranked match hypotheses. This is a precision recall curve for the entire dataset matching performance, showing the precision recall performance just using stage one, which is a whole image matcher, that's the red curve, and the precision recall performance using the entire place recognition system, and that's the blue curve and the system was able to achieve 21% recall at 100% precision. Uh, this is slightly lower than the 35% recall achieved in the original sequence slam study, but we're just using single frames here. We're not using 300 meter sequences of images. So it's a much more challenging problem. This graph shows the precision recall performance when we did a parameter sweep where we evaluated anywhere from one to a thousand of the top ranked place match candidates from stage one of the three stage place recognition system. And you can see that as you evaluate a larger number of candidates, you get better precision recall performance. And when evaluating 500 or more candidates, we were able to hit 51% recall at 100% precision, beating the original sequence slam result. This graph is an alternative representation showing the maximum recall achieved at 100% precision using various number of candidate evaluations. So you can see the number of candidates that were evaluated from one to a thousand along the x-axis and you can see the achievable frame rate uh, labeled on the graph. And this is on a 2011 era dual core laptop. So we're able to evaluate about 150 place match candidates at real time speed on a car driving at about 60 kilometers per hour. You may also note that performance pretty much maxes out above about 200 or 300 candidates and we maintain about 40 to 50 percent recall at 100 percent precision from that point onwards. This is a coverage graph so the x-axis represents the thousand frames from the second traverse of the data set and the y-axis represents frames from the first traverse of the data set. And this graph is showing the correct matches from the second traverse back to the first traverse with red circles. So you can see that there are regular matches all through the thousand frames of the second traverse uh, with the largest gap being about 44 meters. This is compared to a gap in the original sequence slam study of more than a kilometer. 
It's also interesting to note that there's approximately 500,000 candidate match hypotheses output by stage one of the system shown in this figure and the stages two and stages three are able to correctly pick out 510 of the correct match hypotheses while ignoring almost half a million of the incorrect match hypotheses. So this slide shows an example correct match output by the system. The images at the top of the slide are of the same place under different conditions. You can see the contrast normalized images that the patch matching is performed on in the middle of the slide. And you can see the patch match pairs which were output at the bottom left of the slide. And you can see that the shifts at which these patch matches were made were all very coherent as revealed by the very sharp two-dimensional histogram at the bottom right of the slide. On this slide, you can see an example of patch matches that were made by the system. And you can see how high the tolerance is in terms of making patch matches. So the top left pair of patches is of the roof of a house. And if you look at it long enough, you can probably make out the roof in both pictures. The top right patch pair involves a telegraph pole and the bottom patch pair involves a tree line which was matched. So we're matching patches with a very high degree of tolerance and it's only through the coherency check performed in stage three that the system as a whole can function well. This is an example of the most challenging aliased false match in the data set. So these are two images of two different places which just happen to look very similar. The bus stop is in the same position, the light is in the same position, and you can see that the patch match pairs are actually matching these features. It's matching the light, it's matching the bus stop. But when you look at the two-dimensional histogram of matching shifts, you can see that it's not as spatially consistent in the matches. And this is how the system is able to reject this match. Here's a video of the correct matches output by the system when performing at 100% precision. You can see that every now and then it jumps a little bit because we're not able to match every single frame correctly, but we are matching a significant fraction of the environment and the coverage is fairly good because the frames never jump very far. So this would be very useful or very practical for a real life application. We ran the algorithm against humans in a set of human trials. You can see that human performance was fairly consistent across all the different participants. The algorithm was run with different parameters specifying how aggressive the algorithm was in making matches. And you can see that the algorithm was able to perform at a similar precision and recall level simultaneously as the human participants. We've been extending this work in a number of directions. First of all, attempting to deal with the very challenging problem of viewpoint invariance, and we're employing a number of classical approaches to deal with this. With our collaborators at Harvard University, we've been applying models of human visual attention to try and improve performance of the system. And it's quite interesting. If you use a model that predicts where humans look at in a scene when they're performing a face recognition task, you can actually improve both the performance of your place recognition task, which is a different task, and also reduce the computational load because you no longer have to process the entire image. So you get, in effect, a double win, both in terms of performance and computational load. This is a graph which should be out in Journal of Field Robotics this year sometime, showing that with both a human visual attention model and also an edge detection based visual attention model, you can achieve a higher absolute recall level while using only about a third of the image. So you're only having to perform about a third of the computation. So you get better absolute performance and less computation, which is great. Now, excitingly, you too will be able to soon compete against the algorithm using a website. And I'll be posting the link to this in the description for the video shortly. So that brings us to the end of this talk. I hope you found it interesting. We always welcome suggestions for collaboration or ideas or input, or even if you have interesting data sets, which you think might suit this work. We're also always interested in postdocs and PhDs, especially for our new Robotic Vision Center of Excellence, which will be running for the next seven years. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it.